Hi, welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I thought I'd do this video where I went over my top five exoplanets. But these are not the hottest exoplanets, the smallest, the biggest, whatever. This is, well, they're my most interesting dynamically. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's kind of down to their orbits. They have unusual systems, things like that. So it's not necessarily like the hottest ones, the biggest ones. These are ones that I personally find really interesting for various different reasons, which I'll explain as we go through. So my top one, this is my absolute favorite exoplanet for various different reasons. This is Kepler 16b. Now this orbits around the outside of two stars. So it goes around the outside, it's a, it's a circumbinary exoplanet. And it's about the size of Saturn. I put Saturn there. Obviously, the size the sizes of the planet and the stars are not um, exact. They're just kind of here to represent what they're, what they're like. Um, so it's around about the size of Saturn. It doesn't have rings. I'm just using this as an example, really. We know it doesn't have rings, really. We haven't actually seen it. But there are ways we can detect rings, which I've likely done other videos on. But this is, at least size-wise, about the size of Saturn. So it's a gas giant. That in itself, not necessarily that exciting. Gas giants, got loads of them. So nothing exciting there. However, it actually sits in the habitable zone, or the Goldilocks zone, around these two stars. So we know that... If you're so far away from a star that you can actually have liquid water on its surface, then it's in the habitable zone around a single star. But you can still get a habitable zone around two stars. It gets a little bit more complex. It's not perfectly symmetric. It can vary depending on the orbits of the two stars. But basically, this Saturn-sized planet orbits in the habitable zone. It's near the outer edge, so it's not as warm as Earth. In fact, its temperature is, well, you can see it kind of there. It's still fairly cold, but it's still classified as being in the habitable zone. That would be its equilibrium temperature. So as we know on Earth, we have an equ equilibrium temperature, but that doesn't mean that all locations are that temperature. So habitable zone, gas giant, two stars, starting to sound interesting already. However, we know that the actual planet itself is not habitable. It's a gas giant. It's too big. The likely no physical surface, like with Jupiter and Saturn, but it could support an Earth-sized moon. So we could put a moon in orbit around it that had an atmosphere that was the size of Earth, and that would then become habitable. Now, this isn't just randomly thinking of, oh, what can we do? There has been studies on this to see if they're stable. And whilst it's orbiting two stars, you can still have an Earth-sized moon orbiting this gas giant and it be stable so that actually is really exciting and not only is it exciting but what's your seasons going to look like what's your weather going to look like it's going to be very very interesting quite variable but it's nonetheless could still be habitable that's why i find it probably the most interesting one is it has the potential to support life and have life there but it's also unusual it's a moon around a planet around two stars we haven't found the moons, but it has the ability to support it. And that means that there are likely other planets in this configuration that could have Earth-like moons with atmospheres. Now, my second planet is Kepler-64b. You'll also notice as we go through, none of these have really exciting names. They typically take the name of the catalogue or the method in which they were detected. So Kepler just means it's the Kepler Space Telescope that's discovered it. 64b means that it's, it's star 64b means it's the planet. So anyway, this one here, Kepler 64b, this is a planet that orbits four stars. So we've gone up two more stars this time around. We've now got a planet that orbits four instead of two. That is very interesting. Can you imagine what the seasons, the weather would be like on that? So what's the actual system look like? Well, this A component here is an eclipsing binary with a period of 20 days. What do we mean by that? Well, eclipsing binary means that as we look at the stars, 
they actually pass in front of each other. So they block each other's light out. So they actually eclipse each other, which is how we've detected it in the first place. So those are orientated kind of edge on with the orbit. We detect them passing in front of each other and the planet itself goes around those two. Now the orbital period of those, those two stars in the A component is about 20 days. So they're quite close to each other, those two stars. So just to let you know how it was detected and how the eclipsing binary works, on the right hand side you've got a light curve. Now a light curve is the relative brightness of, of the star because we actually can't see both stars. They're too far away but what we do get is the combined magnitude flux brightness of the two stars together and when they pass in front of each other they block each other's light out. Now when they're fully separated like they are on the left hand side there again we can't resolve them but when they're orientated like that we get the light from both stars that's when it appears the brightest. So I've noted there on the light curve and the phase just means that it's time. So the orbital phase of the two, uh, we could put that in time. So the x-axis on that plot there would be time, y-axis is, is, is how bright they actually are. So the top bits is when they're fully separated, that's when it's brightest. We get the components from both stars contributing to the full brightness of what we measure. And then when they're the other way around, so we get the biggest dip when the small star eclipses the larger one like this. So if we're actually looking down this way as, the, as an observer, the small one passes in front of the big one, as you can see there. We get the biggest dip in brightness. It blocks out the most light when it does that. And then the other way around, you should actually get the smallest dip. So this time around, the big star eclipses the smaller star. And then we get this small dip in the middle of the phase there. OK, so that's just how we actually detect these eclipsing binaries. I've done other videos on this in general, which you can kind of check out. So if we go to the other binary system, this is not an eclipsing binary. So we actually don't see them eclipsing each other. But B is a binary star nonetheless. Same sort of configuration, really. They're orbiting their common center of mass. And then you have Kepler 16b, which orbits the A component. And this has a period of just under 140 days, actually. So that goes around the A binary star with about, yeah, just under 140 days, really. Now, Kepler 16, not 16, Kepler 64b, I should say, that was the first one is around the size of Neptune. So again, it's not a habitable planet. It's a fairly large planet, but maybe it's got moons. It doesn't really matter at this point because for me, it's just dynamically interesting. The fact that we've got a planet orbiting four stars is just super exciting. They exist. And if that one exists, what else exists? We're most likely gonna find even more as we detect more exoplanets. So how was it actually detected? Well, it was detected using the transit method. So we know that we had an eclipsing binary, which was the A component. So those two stars eclipsed each other, but then we've got a planet orbiting around the outside of those two stars. So actually the way that it works is that planet also passes in front of one star, then the next star, and you get a bit of a, a chaotic transit somewhat. So we know from the transit method that when a planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some of the light. We get this nice U-shaped dip in brightness as it passes in front. Again, we can't actually resolve the planet. We can only detect the change in brightness of the star. Now, when you've got a binary system, it's a bit more, it's, it's harder to actually pull out the planet transit. Now, this is the light curve, the complete light curve of Kepler 64b. Not, not 64B, but 64, the, the actual system itself. The green ones highlighted here are the planet. And you can see it because they're smaller than the stars, they don't block out quite as much light. The bigger vertical, they're not really lines, but you can see where you've got the dots going vertically, which is each individual measurement, is the actual stars, the eclipsing binary. So you've had to pull that out of the full light curve there. So it's quite complex to do, but anyway, we could do another video on this to look into it in more detail, but the point is it was detected from the transit 
of this planet in front of the, the eclipsing binary. Now, each individual transit was different, and that's because it's passing in front of different stars. And not only that, the stars are in different configurations. They're all moving, the planet's moving. So sometimes it takes longer or shorter amount of time to pass in front of the star. So you'll find that the transit can be narrower or wider. It'll block out more or less light because one of the stars is bigger than the other. It blocks out more as a percentage wise. So they change depending on when and what star it actually transits. So when you have an eclipsing binary, it's a little bit different than a normal single star. Anyway, the really interesting thing here is, well, maybe it's not interesting actually because it's not in the habitable zone, but we can look at the habitable zone and it's inside it. So unfortunately, this time round, it's too hot. So you can see the sort of temperature that is, that's too hot to be habitable around this, this A binary system. However, you know, what if you actually had another planet there, which we haven't detected yet, which is a little bit further out? Maybe you've got moons there. Maybe if you had a moon, you could actually have locations on there that were habitable. Maybe the moon's tidally locked. So it's not quite as interesting habitability-wise as the first one, but it is orbiting four stars, which makes it a little bit more complex. So that's my first two. What's the third one? Well, the third one probably has the worst storms and seasonal variations of any exoplanet or planet discovered so far. So this is HD 80606b, bit of a mouthful. Again, it's due to a catalogue name of the star. The B part means it's the first planet detected around this particular star. So where do we start? Well, the star that it orbits is actually part of a binary. Though, so you've got HD 80606, and then you've got HD 80607, and this forms a binary star, and they are separated by just over 1000 AU, where 1 AU is an astronomical unit, and that's the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So actually, as stars go, it's relatively nearby, actually, they're fairly close. So you've got a planet orbiting one star in a binary. That's a different configuration to what you have with the Kepler 16b, where you're orbiting around the outside of the two. So again, interesting to start with. This planet, however, is it's another massive one. It's a gas giant four times the mass of Jupiter. So again, we're not going to have life on that. It's too big. We need a terrestrial planet, really. Now, the more interesting thing about this particular planet, as well as it being in a binary system and orbiting one of them, is it's very elliptical. Its orbit is very, very elliptical. In fact, probably one of the most elliptical orbits of a planet, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I might be wrong, but I believe it might be one of the most elliptical orbits we've discovered so far. And it takes just over... 111 days to do a full orbit. So again, it's fairly close to its star. And its eccentricity, this is a measure of how elliptical it is, is 0.9336. Now, anything over one, and it's not on an orbit, it'll be on a like a parabolic orbit. Anything less than one, it's on an orbit. And just to give you context, really, long period comets that originate from the Oort cloud, which is the, our very outer part of our solar system, have eccentricities fairly similar to this. So this is a very elliptical orbit for a planet. It's pretty much like a comet. So it's like a cometary orbit. Very unusual. So um, just to give you an idea, then, because it's elliptical, it gets close to its star and then much further away. Now, at its closest point, the pericenter, it is 0 0.0309 AU from its star. That's just 10% of Mercury's orbit. That's really close to its star. So if you think about Mercury, Mercury is pretty close to our sun. Well, this gets within 10% of Mercury's orbit to its star. That's really close to its star. And then at its maximum point, it gets to 0.8821 AU. Now, for context, 
that's in between the orbits of Venus and Earth. So it doesn't get that far away, but if you consider that actually it's going to, it would likely, well, it, if it was in the solar system, it would cross Mercury and Venus's orbit and get much, much closer. So it's varying its distance from its star an enormous amount during one orbit, which is just over 111 days. Now, what does this do? It causes enormous temperature changes on the planet by varying this distance. And again, that's you know under a third of a year for Earth, we would experience massive fluctuations on the amount of flux reaching the surface. And that would drive enormous temperature changes during one orbit or one year. Can you imagine that on Earth, that we would actually have such huge changes in temperature? And as it actually approaches its closest point, the pericenter, the temperatures will rise more than 555 Kelvin, which is a, just over 280 degrees Celsius or nearly 540 degrees Fahrenheit in just a matter of hours. So it would suddenly rise in a matter of hours. That's going to cause havoc on the planet. And it does because simulations have actually try to calculate or work out what is happening with the weather on this planet. Well, they've discovered that it can drive winds of up to 11,000 miles per hour. So the side that faces towards the star gets superheated. You're going to get kind of enormous storms forming there, which will drive winds in excess of or up to 11,000 miles per hour. Can you imagine that? And because the other side of the planet is still cool, that well, basically the hot side, the air rises and then it will circulate round to the other side. That's what drives your massive wind. So you're going to get enormous winds, enormous seasonal changes on this planet, purely down to the fact that it actually behaves a bit like a comet, not like a planet. Now, my fourth planet is not really a planet. It's a planetary system. And this is known as PSR B1257 plus 12. Again, another mouthful, bit of a boring name. What that tells you is it's a pulsar. These are three planets orbiting a pulsar. And if you don't know what pulsars are, I will just give you a quick recap. So pulsars are kind of the end point of some of the most massive stars. The most massive stars will, call, will create a black hole, but in between solar mass stars, like lower mass stars, and the really big stars, you get neutron stars and pulsars being formed when they actually end their nuclear fusion in their core. So on the main sequence, normal stars, like our sun at the moment, it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. It means that it's generating energy in its core, that causes an outward pressure, which balances the gravitational force trying to collapse it. Now, when the star runs out of fuel, that pressure stops. There's no energy being created anymore and it collapses. Now, the big stars have greater gravitational force. That means they can collapse their cores down to neutron stars and pulsars. A, a sun-like star would become a white dwarf. You don't get a supernova. But with these bigger stars, you get a supernova. So that fusion stops in the core, it collapses, you then get a supernova being formed. This is the Crab Nebula, which actually has a pulsar in the centre. The outer layers of that star then create this supernova remnant. So the fact that you've got a pulsar and you've got planets, start to think about that. Those planets have had to survive a supernova. Or have they? So, pulsars, they're incredibly fast spinning neutron stars and they can spin up to hundreds of times per second. They have these polar jets, which we see as a pulse. Those polar jets that they're emitting very high energy, they're from the magnetic axis and the magnetic axis doesn't align to the rotation axis. So they kind of sweep out like a lighthouse. As we look at them from Earth, we get a pulse every time they go round. So that's why they're called pulsars, basically. And they're about the size of a city. Yet, they can be 
massive. They they will weigh more than our sun, but they'll be the size of a city. So they're very very dense. So the actual system itself, you've got the pulsar in the centre, very dense object emitting these regular pulses. You've got two sub Neptunes. They could be super Earths, but I believe they are probably sub Neptunes. We classify them as on the outer part of the system, and then closer to the pulsar, there's a small terrestrial planet and I say small it's smaller than earth it's quite a small terrestrial planet so that's the system we actually have three planets orbiting this pulsar now where did they come from it's highly unlikely they survived the supernova massive stars typically don't form planets they have enormous solar wind which prevents planets forming around them in the first place but if they did form they wouldn't survive the supernova most likely that have been destroyed, or when the supernova happened, they, the, the actual pulsar, the, the star, loses mass, and these planets get ejected. So it's unlikely that they actually formed before the supernova happened and remained. So where did they actually come from? Well, they could actually have formed afterwards, but I've got a separate video on that that you can check out. But anyway, very interesting. Now, my last exoplanet is actually our nearest exoplanet. And it's again, it's a dynamically interesting one. This is Proxima Centauri b. Our nearest exoplanet, it's the size of Earth, it orbits three stars, and it's habitable. What more could you ask for? So, similar size and mass to Earth. It's about one and a third times the radius of Earth, so it's a little bit bigger size-wise, and slightly more massive but it's approximately quite similar to Earth. Again, this is our nearest exoplanet. The actual star that it orbits is a red dwarf, a very small star, very cool star. So it's just under, well, it's almost half the temperature as the sun. It's a very cool, very small star, Proxima Centauri. Now it's part of a three star system, so Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B are the two bigger components. You've then got the smaller red dwarf, Proxima Centauri, and they are just over four light years away. That's not far at all. That's actually close enough for us to go visit. I mean, four light years, yeah, that's a, that's a long way, but that's not out of reach for us as humans to actually go and see and go and visit. So, Proxima Centauri b, it has a semi-major axis of 0.05 AU, very close to its star. It has to be to be habitable. It's a small, very cold star. So in order for it to be hot enough to have liquid water on its surface, it needs to be really close. This means that its orbital period is 11 days. So again, very close to its star. Just to give a bit of context, really, Mercury has an orbital period of 88 days and has a semi-major axis or orbital radius of 0.4 AU. So, the, again, very close to its star, but it's still in the habitable zone. Now, we believe that it's tidally locked. So we believe, because it's so close to its star, the tides from the star have actually slowed its rotation down and it's now tidally locked. If you want a, a real world example that you can see now of a tidally locked object, just look at the moon. Go out tonight if you've got a clear sky, you'll always see the same face facing towards us because the tides from Earth acting on the moon have slowed its rotation down so that it, as it goes around in one orbit, it will rotate once on its axis. So it always faces the same way. So tidally locked. That makes it interesting as well. Now, it's orbiting the inner edge of the habitable zone this time around. So you've got the habitable zone around Proxima Centauri, and it's quite close to the inner edge. That means that it's going to be slightly warmer than Earth, likely, because we're not on the inner edge. We're a bit further out than that. But it still has the potential to be habitable, because bear in mind, it's tidally locked. There's parts of that planet that are not facing the star, which will be cooler. So, the actual system itself, 
you have the Alpha Centauri binary. You've got the AB component there. Now, they have an orbital period of about, well, just under 80 years and a semi-major axis of a, just under 24 AU. So um, they're orbiting each other basically like that. Um, those orbits are highly elliptical. So it means that the, well, the orbits of the two stars are quite elliptical. They get close to each other, then they get further away and so on. So those themselves are fairly interesting as well because the stars are quite elliptical on their orbits. Um, it's Alpha Centauri A, this one is a little bit bigger than the Sun, so slightly bigger radius wise, about 1.2 the mass of the Sun, and it's about one and a half times more luminous than the Sun, so a bit brighter, one and a half times brighter than the Sun. The Alpha Centauri B part is a little bit smaller than the Sun, so this time around it's a little bit smaller radius wise, 0.859 the mass of the Sun, and about half the brightness or luminosity of the sun. So this is a fairly dim star in comparison. Now, the actual Proxima Centauri, the smaller red dwarf star, goes around the actual AB component. So, sent, so this goes around the AB, so yeah, the AB Alpha Centauri part has a semi-major axis of 8,700 AU, it has a very large orbital period, so 547,000 years. So it's on a very wide, big orbit. And it's also on an elliptical orbit as well. So it's not a circular orbit. It means it gets very close to AB and then further away. That, again, makes it very interesting. So very high eccentricity, about a half. That's again a bit like a comet. It quite it has a very high inclination as well. It means the orbit is very inclined in comparison to the AB component. That's unusual. Normally, when things form together, conservation of angular momentum means that they will all orbit in the same plane. Think about the orbits of the planets, the rotation of our sun, the orbits of the moon. They're all fairly close to being on a common plane. This star is orbiting out of the plane of the other two. That's unusual. What that suggests is it was probably captured. So you've, what you would have had is this Alpha Centauri A and B on its own. And then you had this other star, this red dwarf star, Proxima Centauri, that was on its own. And it got close to the binary and it was gravitationally captured onto this unusual orbit. So that... It's really exciting. Did it have a planet before it did that? What happened to that planet during the capture process? Was it always habitable or has it become habitable now? This, there's so many questions here and it's also our nearest one. So this has a lot of possibilities and actually it's one that I think we really want to go and visit. We should really go there because it's not that far away. And it's not the only planet there. I've only mentioned Proxima Centauri B because it's in the habitable zone. But it's, ex well, I don't expect it. We think it's got three. So Proxima Centauri C and D. One of those is kind of a bit controversial, but I'll mention them nonetheless. One of those is on inside of the habitable zone, so that will be too hot. And then the other one is further out. So it's a planetary system. It's not just a single planet. Again, we really need to kind of go here and have a look at it because I think there's going to be some very interesting things going on in this system. Now, thank you for watching. I hope you kind of enjoyed um, me explaining what my favourite exoplanets are. If you've got a favourite exoplanet, just let me know down in the comments below. I'll be very interested to find that out. And if you do in find these videos interesting, then do consider becoming a member. I have extra videos kind of in the members section as well as other benefits and it just generally helps support the channel as well. So thank you for watching.